so much drama in the Bratz universe. <laughs> What it is, this is Sorogen next from the blog Sword to the Max .com. I apologize in advance about my voice. I am sick of the dog, y'all, but I'm gonna try to push through because <laughs> I wanted to talk about this. I recently got into an interesting discussion with a Bratz fan who has insider knowledge on Bratz. I'm not going to disclose this person for the sake of their privacy. However, I do just want to mention that they stated that they have connections with MGA and that they've worked closely with the CEO and others in the company. This discussion began quietly in a fan community. I hadn't yet made it known that I was the blogger Sorogen next before this point, okay, before we got into this discussion. Throughout the discussion, I added my two cents, okay, uh, just based off of the conversations I've had on my blog, some of the things I've been researching about the industry, you know, I added my two cents and some of my theories. Obviously, I was like, I don't know everything, but this was a big mistake because uh, the group that supports this fan insider in this community, they soared in to come for me and everything I was saying. I was like, wow, I'm pretty irrelevant in my opinion. I'm just a poor black African-American woman with few connections, but a love of dogs. <laughs> I don't know nothing. I'm just a messenger. You know, to come so strong, it must not have been the first time they've heard some of the information coming from my blog. It must have been repeated to them so many times that it annoyed them because I was just saying, this is what I believe or, you know, and they were like, uh, what you're saying isn't factual. It was a belief. Okay. So their responses sounded like they've heard what I've said before. Um, it actually made me shocked because I realized for the first time that people actually read the information that comes out of my blog. <laughs> I didn't know how to take this. It made me realize that I have a certain responsibility to make sure that whatever comes out of my blog and videos isn't just a venting area, but a place where I need to actually refine and express more clarity. Um, I still want my spaces to open up conversation and I want new information to flow in and out. But I also realized that the conversations made here have been traveling. That's not a bad thing. However, that makes me more determined to step up my game. I aim to answer fans' questions because I had the same question. And I know other fans have similar questions to me about Brat. Okay, I want to know everything. Everything I possibly can. Okay, so this insider, that's what we'll call them has been hearing many different rumors and ideas regarding the Brass Doll's sudden shift in aesthetic in 2015 and have heard similar things regarding the 2018 reboot, especially when it comes to the decision for MGA to make the new Brass into a collector's line and sell the dolls online. The rumors and ideas they were saying they heard seem to mirror exactly what's been coming out of my blog. Apparently, everything I said uh, annoyed, excuse me, this person and their friends because they feel they know the truth. Basically, this group immediately said my information is inaccurate and factual and that I really don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so overall, basically, my information and the knowledge I've gathered here challenges the insider's knowledge and information and that annoys the insider and the insider's followers. I think the insider knows a lot about what has been going on and this person has, has educated me on some things going on with the Brat's brand, which I appreciate because I never profess to know more than anyone else. Um, I get all of my sources from other people. But there are some truths I stand by based on my own research and experiences. Um, I know I'm going to get all kinds of backlash for it because I'm a little person in the Brat's community, you know, and it's not easy to stand up to a big dog, especially when I have always respected the person too. You know, I've been a big supporter of this person for a long time. So it's like, it's hard when you disagree with someone you know has more power than you do in the community, okay? Especially because I'm disagreeing from an objective perspective rather than an inside perspective. So anyway, moving on. Um, I used to be a part of the bratsworld.co.uk community back in 2001. The but the community was um, far more friendly, fun, and open to discussion when it was just a Yahoo group. 
The moderator was a user named Snowflake BB. Um, I haven't been a part of a Bratz fan group since that group got quiet thanks to more advanced social media platforms. Um, the fan groups out now are far quicker to insult or throw shade on new ideas. You know, they are not open enough to have discussions, like, or even consider your point of view without throwing shade. You know, if your opinion differs, you're just stupid, okay? Like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, you're, that's not factual. How, how do you know? Give me a chance to explain myself. You know, that doesn't happen anymore. So, furthermore, um, in order for your ideas to be taken seriously nowadays, or in order for it to be considered, people only want to know whether you've worked with a related company. Like, people are not allowed to give their own enlightened observations anymore. You know, I feel you can't always go by people who work within an industry to know the business, especially because some of them have the goal of supporting that business. You know, if I work for Starbucks, I'm going to say nice things about Starbucks because I work for them, you know? So sometimes you can't always trust everything you hear from a worker. But, uh, excuse me, there, there's some things, some knowledge you can gain from them, okay? Uh, consumers also drive the industry, though. So their thoughts and opinions on what's going on outside of the business matters, too. You know, the general viewpoint of the industry molds and shapes the industry, too. So I always feel everyone's opinions are valid in some way. You know, but that's me. So anyway, all I'm saying is that it's important to hear someone else's side of the story sometimes, okay? Uh, the insider has been relatively cordial and respectful, even if they did give a heart to a very shady comment towards me. I was like, wow. But, um... They've been relatively cordial, but their followers really don't play nice. So, as a warning to anyone who wants to share their view out there in the fan community, weigh in on who you approach and talk to. Um, anyway, I'm not really here to talk about Bratz fan communities. That's a subject for another day. This video will be uh, me clearing the air, addressing the conversation I had with the insider in my own home, my platform, and really trying to weed out the truth among all the conversations I've had. So... Remember we had been discussing about the 2015 Bratz reboot? Remember how I spoke about how the events that happened with Bratz in 2015 might impact Bratz in 2018? Remember how we've been talking about retailers and how they shape the industry? How um, they have a lot of power? Um, remember how I mentioned that maybe MGA couldn't use the old facial design? Or maybe I didn't mention that to y'all, but I mentioned that on my blog that uh, maybe they're not using the old facial design because they can't. Maybe they can't. I had mentioned that. Um, I also, or maybe they don't want to, you know, different things like that uh, for maybe legal reasons or we don't know the reasons, okay? I would mentioned that. And then I would mentioned how feminists and soccer moms control the industry or are influencing the culture, okay? And I mentioned this a lot because a lot, a lot of articles support this. And I've shared all those articles in all my videos. So anyway, um, if you haven't watched my video or read my articles on this topic, you can review them below. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, well, um, anyway, most of that information I've gathered stemmed from a discussion with Carter Bryant. Uh, he basically made me more aware about the power of the retail industry at large. And he didn't correct or deny anything that I've said. So everything else I've spoken about not only came from other readers who made me aware that feminists and moms play a large factor in shaping retail, but also from observations of toy fairs in recent years and advertisements that align with certain modern social agendas. It's not that difficult to come to the assessment that feminists and moms have been having influence over the doll industry and seeking to shape it. You know, mostly I've presented this information as persuasive arguments based on what I've been reading across the internet and toy industry communities I'm connected with which, you know, I collect other dolls besides Barbie and Bratz. Um, if you read all these news and blog articles and watch my video, uh, or watch videos about this subject, you know, and observe what's been coming out of fan favorite lines recently and looking at the source as to why these companies try to meet the ever vocal feminist and mommy groups, you could easily realize that this isn't news. It's not news. I'm just delivering it, but it's not news, really. According to the female factor, statistics show that women drive an estimated 70 to 80 percent of consumer spending with their purchasing power and influence. According to NPD.com, moms rule retail. Their article on this issue states, 
Most retailers would no doubt like to have both generations of mothers visit their establishments and websites. When you sell what moms buy, you want to sell to everyone's mom. No retailer markets itself out to be just for one particular set of moms. They talk about Gen X and Gen Y moms. You know, yet the generations have distinct preferences about where they shop. So retailers that over-index for one group tend to under-index for the other group. So basically, this is just stating that most retailers want to sell to everyone's mom. Okay, they want to pander to moms. So th there are business articles out there that show this. Even the advice on this business website gave this suggestion. Uh, millennial moms are 58% more likely than older moms to value visibility in advertising. And they're 32% more likely than older moms to place importance on what they hear about a retailer in the news. So if you head up advertising or PR on the retailer side, it would serve you well to target the younger mom demographic in your campaigns. Read my article on breast versus feminist, over sexualized or empowering. It sheds more light on how moms think can shape media and even how feminists shape media. Um, so that's part of where I got my ideas on moms and feminists running retail. Um, where I got the idea that retailers have the power that came from Carter Bryant. So to reiterate my conversation with Bryant, um, I'll just reiterate that conversation uh, for you real quick. All right, I will reiterate. So right here in uh, conversation three, he said if he were at the helm, he would be fairly powerless to give this brand much of a new kick. He said he would have tried to move the brand into 2015 and beyond. However, retailers control the biz and these days do not take risks with a lot of rebranding. In my opinion, the Bratz can't go home. So they might as, they can't go big. So they might as well go home. Y'all reading carefully, right? We're talking 2015 here. It's not just me coming up with this stuff. It's what he said, okay? So let's continue. Let me show you the final conversation that's key to this whole thing. So he literally said these words, retailers control the shots and the direction of what hits their shelves. Even when consumers speak out to the manufacturers about what they would love to have, ultimately the retailers, buyers, will dictate every last detail that ends up on their aisles unless the MFTSers are uber powerful. It can have some heavy-handed influence on toy buyers. He was saying, i.e., Disney and Mattel. Okay? Because of these statements, I suggested that MGA sell the brass dolls retailers won't take online, basically as exclusives. Um, I was the only one who suggested this. Uh, another reader also said, well, what if we uh, directed the brats as exclusives to the retail chains? Would they then approve of them with that help so i this is what we were thinking okay if retailers have the power as suggested then maybe selling it as an exclusive would help so i was kind of freaked out when i heard brats was being sold on amazon as an exclusive this year it got me thinking did they listen to my idea like in 2016 my idea was to have a brat store online where brats exclusive products are sold 
In fact, I listed a few things I thought would help improve the brand on my article, Brad Stahl Say Goodbye to the Toy Industry, which you can see that below. Um, I did understand that a retail support helps a brand, though. So I assumed they would partner with some retail stores outside of the online market. You know, I didn't think the first line ever would appear <coughs> exclusively on Amazon. You know, if uh, retailers had the power to shake the brats as Carter implied they did, then I felt selling on Amazon was a good move, though. You know, I don't know. I might have influenced that decision, or maybe they were thinking of doing this all along. But it was kind of a coincidence that the dolls were sold exclusively online two years after my other article. If MGA did consider my idea, you know, why did they? Why did they also think it was a good idea or um, think on the same line of thinking? Uh, but back on topic, I gave this suggestion because of Bryant's assertion that market buyers control the industry, whether we like it or not. I wasn't the only one who suggested this, as I said, okay? Carter Bryant seemed to know a lot about the issue. You know, working in the doll industry for 20 plus years, I'm sure he has had his share of experiences. Though the incident with the fashion pixies happened in a different era and, and many veteran fans consider it a, a once in a lifetime thing, that it didn't happen frequently, Carter Bryant used the fashion pixies as an example to express overall how retail controls the business a lot more than just with that one incident. It seemed like he was saying that even if he were at the helm, he would be powerless because retailers control the biz overall. This conversation was focused on 2015, Bratz, and how retail continues to control the business side of the Fashion Pixies incident. This is what led me to analyze how market, toy, and or business buyers influenced the direction of Bratz in 2015, and how they have been influencing the toy industry in general. And there's no mistake, no matter what anyone says, if you study the market and retail industry, Retail influences the toy industry largely, okay? Women, who are mothers and feminists as well, many of them being supportive of the agenda to desexualize and make underdogs, also influence the toy industry, <coughs> no matter how you look at it. Um, however, apparently, according to this insider, none of the above is actually the truth when it comes to this, the decisions made with the 2015 brats. Also, according to the insider, the decision to sell Bratz in 2018 as a collective exclusive and to sell the Bratz online has little to do with MGA avoiding the need to pitch to family-friendly retailers either. So here's the tea. A new voice has spoken up about the 2015 Bratz. This insider has not only worked for the Bratz or befriended people on the team, they are fans themselves, as I mentioned. So basically, this person said, that retailers have little control over what comes out of brats, okay? Basically, they're saying that all retailers do is make little notes, and they usually don't even pay attention to the little details, okay? Um, and this insider is saying that basically all the ideas uh, that come out of the company, the problem is that they're just hits and misses by the CEO and the teams he's hired. So the insider s believes the issue is internal paranoia and their unfounded fear of making ways with toy marketers. Fascinating, right? So the insider has basically said that the rumors spread out there about retail controlling the industry and soccer moms and feminists having control are not factual. <clears throat> the only one who has put that information out there is me. So basically, I felt that this was a disagreement about the information I presented. Um, at first, I believe this was an attack on my credibility as a writer and informist. However, I began to look at this situation as a chance to get the truth of the matter. If what I've been saying hasn't been the truth all along, what is it? I decided to ask as many questions I could think of to get to the bottom of things. As a blog journalist, and actually that was supposed to be my major in college, but later about that, I am inquisitive, okay? I want to know every last detail and morsel about this whole brat situation. I'm not going to disregard the former information I've gathered, and as I go through this, you'll learn why, but all information brings the picture full circle. Um, it seems those who once worked with MGA disagree with who controls the direction of brats, and that's what's most interesting about the brats business. Really, that's been brats' whole issue. Who owns them? Who controls them? You know, chaos surrounds this brand. 
Um, the insider I spoke with has more recent connections with the brand, while Carter Bryant has been working in the toy industry for 20 plus years. So it's difficult to know who has more knowledge about the issues and who doesn't. Speaking with this insider, they do seem to know a lot about the goings on in many ways. However, I do have a lot of questions about some of the statements made. Because overall, after the end of the discussion, I was left with more questions than answers. Okay, I was, um, we, I'm hearing from Carter Bryan, who is basically a designer, a consultant, and a creative director. And hearing from the insider who said they were working with the managing team. And, you know, I, that's all I know. They didn't really give too much information about their role. So let me get to it. Let me bring out this person's points. I will bring it, bring it all down and help you all digest it while I digest it, okay? In our first discussion, there have been some heavy criticisms about the new 2018 breast facial screenings. I will elaborate more on it in my breast 2018 review coming up later. Um, what are facial screenings? The breast face design in a nutshell, okay? So um, MGA, MGA has recently announced the new face screenings on Facebook and Twitter, as you guys know. Um, in this discussion, I'd mentioned that maybe MGA isn't using the facial screenings fans have been asking for, the 2001 facial screenings, you know, the seductive, sultry screenings. I was mentioning that maybe MGA couldn't or they don't want to for some reason. Uh, I put it out there that maybe the court cases have affected what MGA is allowed to use or maybe it has affected what they want to use, you know. Maybe they want to deviate from Brian's design as much as possible, just to avoid any future issues. Maybe not totally, because that's the core of their brand, but just a little bit. You know, perhaps they even want these new dolls to feel more like Hayden's. I don't know. You know, this isn't based on any particular evidence of anything, just a theory based on me putting myself in MGA shoes. If I had gone through uh, drama because of older brass dolls and their design and had all these court, this court case, fia case fiasco, you know, I'd be desperate to walk away from the drama as much as I possibly can without throwing away my million to billion dollar brand, okay? So that was just me doing that, you know. Uh, this means if I were in the business, I would keep the parts of Bratz that made them passable to fans while trying to change the portions of the brand that caused controversy. This is if I wasn't a fan of Bratz, but just a business person, Okay. Or if I couldn't use the old artwork, I would want to separate the brand from its past as much as possible so there wouldn't be any more issues. So that that's what I put out there. Maybe maybe they couldn't use it, or maybe they don't they don't want to for legal reasons or to avoid drama. This was just me giving a theory. But the people in this in his in this insider's camp weren't having it. Okay? They did not like what I said and thought I was misinformed. They didn't know what I was talking about. So the insiders group told me. And I'm assuming they got this info from the insider that MGA owns everything regarding the Bratz now, that the court cases have no influence on Bratz anymore, and that MGA won the court case, which from my understanding, I thought it was just settled, but okay. And uh, MGA has the rights to the original 2001 doll screenings now, so there's no excuse as to why they're not using the old screen. So basically, I'm stupid. I'm stupid for even thinking maybe there was some logical reason why a company has constantly ignored fans' desire to have 2001 screenings returned. Okay, I could take an L, but now I want answers. Why is MGA avoiding giving fans 2001 screenings when that has been one of the most desired, most asked for requests? We never ask for new screenings. So why do we keep getting new screenings? So that's still out there and I never got an answer to that. So the funny thing is, um, I mentioned this same theory in my 2015 review article. I mentioned that maybe MGA couldn't use the old drawings or face screenings. In the same article I mentioned it, Carter Bryant said my article was well-researched and accurate. He didn't deny or correct anything that I said. If the legal cases had nothing to do with the usage of the screenings, why wasn't that corrected by uh, Carter Bryant? You know, so I wonder about that too, okay? So this is exactly what I said. Perhaps MGA had to deviate away from the original designs due to the court cases. MGA had to remove all first-wave brats from shelves and they are no longer allowed to utilize the original look for the brats. This could be why there is a change in the eyes, clearly going from being glossy eye to being doe eye. That loss <laughs> in the court case really changed the brats. May, MGA may be trying their hardest to make brats as similar to how they used to be as possible without stirring another court case battle. For my understanding, they have to be careful using the format given to them by Carter Bryant. It really is a shame because those details make a world of a difference. 
still the only thing they may not be allowed to use are the eyes and original facial structures. This shouldn't affect their fashion sense, though. Perhaps we will see more future, more fashion lines like the study abroad line in the future. So this is exactly what I said in that 2015 article. Brian didn't seem to have a problem addressing anything else. Why wasn't this addressed? I mean, it was just a theory based on how I've seen other companies behave, especially after court cases. Still, he didn't seem to think this needed to be corrected. Maybe he also believed MGA didn't want to use his design or couldn't. I don't know. Moving on, let me address some other comments made by the insider. So I made some theories as to why I thought MGA may have decided to go with an exclusive collector's line first at this time. I had the assumption that MGA didn't really necessarily make the collector's edition dolls to please longtime fans, but to get away with making the dolls edgy. So this is me assuming retailers control the game and how things go, and maybe they wanted to use this collector's exclusive as a way to get the dolls around uh, retailers, okay? So yes, I know every company always wants to please fans, obviously, but they could have aimed to please fans with regular play lines. They didn't have to have that aim through a collector's line. So I thought that they just couldn't, for some reason, please fans and market buyers at the same time. I thought that there was more to it than just, you know, this was just a hit and miss of them trying to please fans, because that, that's basically what the insider suggesting, that the uh, 2018 Bratz was their attempt to please fans. They made it an exclusive because they felt that with Hayden's name, it would do that. So I'm going to um, read what the insider said. The insider said the core goal for this Brass 2018 reboot, I'm assuming, was always genuinely to please the fans and make it up to us. That's why Isaac made it a point to bring uh, Paula in and to tell us about that detail. As I've said before in other threads, the issue with dolls today is not because of retailers or soccer moms or whatever else many people think. Almost all of it stems from internal paranoia and a general fear of making waves on the part of toy marketers. I can say this with full certainty having worked on MGA's marketing team and having heard personally from Isaac himself how he works with retailer feedback. Paula's advantage was that she doesn't have that paranoia and was even responsible for pushing the envelope the most with Brad. She has maintained that she would never work on Bratz again unless she could be certain that they remain true to their original vision all the way to launch. Because she has seen this exact scenario play out time and time again, and she doesn't want to be left with the blame when it inevitably goes south. That's why she left the team early on in the 2010 era, 2015 era, and surely 2018 era. So um, I found out about this worker named Paula from the book You Don't Own Me. I think I mentioned I would talk about this book to someone who commented to me on one of my videos. Basically, because uh, they asked me, I told them that I would tell them where I found out some information about Bratz. So basically, this book gives the background of the whole court case fiasco and what went down between Bratz and Barbie. Um, on Amazon, they have a hard copy, internet version, audio versions, you know. So it's an interesting read. Uh, but I'd heard this insider never read that book. And I heard the insider um, on their... Kind of their Ask FM, they said that they don't like to, to read about the court cases. They just want to know about the dolls. So anyway, while the insider is relatively respected by those that surround them, and they've said a lot that makes sense above, here's the line that baffles me. The line where they said, as I have said before in other threads, the issue with dolls today is not because of retailers or soccer moms or whatever else many people think. Almost all of it stems from internal paranoia and a general fear of making waves on the part of toy marketers. The insider says that the issues don't come from retail or soccer moms and whatever else. But then the insider says it stems from internal paranoia and general fear of making waves with toy marketers. So my next question is this. Where does the internal paranoia come from then? Why are companies today paranoid? What are they paranoid about? You can't be paranoid about something if nothing was brought to your attention to begin with to make you paranoid. You can't be paranoid without pressure. Sure, Paula, she's the worker was brave enough to face the storm, but why don't other companies want to take the risk? What are they afraid of um, if there's more advantage to taking risks than not? Okay, the brats have sold billions taking risks, so what are they afraid of? Okay, in real time, obviously, feminists and soccer moms are directly boycotting and protesting and sending nasty letters to some of these companies every day. You know, most of them pay little attention to what's going on in the toy world. But this doesn't mean they aren't working in high industry positions that put pressure on the industry as a whole. 
This doesn't mean that soccer moms and feminists aren't influencing the current toy culture at large and really culture in general. So if it isn't them, then who is creating the paranoia within these companies? Throughout this conversation, I felt like I never really got an answer to that question. And I, <coughs> well, excuse me, I really would like to know. Um, I also want to analyze the toy marketers uh, bit of the conversation. A toy marketer is someone who aims to maximize profits, which means basically receive the most money through developing sales strategies, basically make plans by making plans that match customer requirements, basically all of our expectations, and by promoting products, services, or ideas regarding toys, okay? So apparently, toy marketers have the most influence on companies today from what I'm reading from this insider. If companies are afraid to make waves with these people, these people must be the ones calling the shots. So that leaves me with another question. If these toy marketers influence companies, what are toy marketers' aim? What do toy marketers today want from companies to the point companies are shifting their focus so they won't make waves with them? If this is the case at MGA, what are toy marketers themselves demanding, especially to the point companies fear making waves with them? Why are toy marketers... Uh, uh, charging to change, uh, uh, seeking to change the image of all of these brands. It's pretty obvious that dolls are aiming to be far more wholesome and far more inclusive nowadays. Is that a result of internal paranoia and the avoidance of making waves with toy marketers? If so, are all of these toy marketers working with soccer moms and feminists? Because all of the dolls out nowadays seem set to create these kinds of empowering and wholesome images pushed for by moms and some, not all, feminist communities nowadays and we're talking even outside of the fashion doll industry so if someone can answer that question for me then i would under better understand uh this internal paranoia and these toy marketers so let's look at the next point in the conversation the insider said we can't say for sure how Bratz would have launched before Hayden entered the equation, but the collector label was only ever mentioned after, and having literally witnessed these email conversations, the vibe is that they saw Hayden as a big name they were collaborating with, and that is the reason they decided to go for a collector's edition release. Otherwise, I firmly believe Carla <coughs> would have delivered us some solid Playline dolls to be sold at whatever retailers they could finesse and believe me Isaac is very good at finessing them brats were also hugely popular and relevant as this would have been happening only making them an easier sell MGA is a playline company they aren't cut out for true collector dolls as we are all seeing right now they're aware of this fact and wouldn't have seen a need to limit their reach like that otherwise again I say this with certainty because brats collector is even a concept I worked on while I was there they just really believed that Hayden's name alone would bring in a lot of sales and would constitute a collector label. It's no small news that fans asked and asked for Hayden Williams to be the designer for the Bratz next relaunch. And it makes sense that they would put his name on the label, okay, to, to make this a collector's exclusive. That makes sense. But uh, I still don't understand why it had to be a collector's exclusive for them to put their, his name on it. And I don't understand why they made that the first comeback line, despite the fact Hayden, you know, is relatively new to the doll design industry. That's perplexing, okay? Uh, my big question is this. Though we know Hayden has a following, did MJ really think Hayden was big enough to disregard a worker who'd been with the team for over 10 years? If Paula was able to deliver the solid play lines as expected, why have MGA disregarded her for the last couple of years? Why was she disregarded in 2015, or why wasn't her expertise considered in 2015? What is it about Paula that MGA has lost faith in? Is it that she's from the old uh, Bryant, uh, Carter Bryant team, or what? Why won't they trust her 100%? Why have they put more faith in marketers and fan designers and less faith in Paula? If anything, this could have been a straight collaborative effort between Paula and Aiden Williams. So I don't understand why they would release their first line as a collector's exclusive, number one. 
And number two, I don't understand why they wouldn't trust Paula's expertise. Um, I have no doubt that a collector's label, again, was placed because of Hayden's involvement, but is it truly the only reason they wanted to utilize the collector's label? You know, they could have had Hayden design a play line with the collector's label, um, with, with his name on it, you know, without a collector's label. Um, Hayden still could have promoted it on Instagram, uh, you know, and, and on his social media. They've had collector's edition dolls before. They wouldn't need Hayden to label it the way they did. So I'm sure Isaac Larry is uh, good at pitching the brats to any retailer he wants to. I'm sure he's good at that. You know, he's an expert CEO who has helped in building a brand like this from a privately owned company. But that doesn't mean it doesn't take hard work and a good strategy to do so. So I'm sure selling online took less time and less go-throughs than trying to pitch this idea or finesse it to retailers. You know, who wouldn't want to find the easy way out? But... If there were no other factors and they literally just thought having a fan name would drive sales, I don't get it. So, you know, but so be it. But as I theorize, and as I asked, did they feel they would be able to do more with the line by calling it Collector's Edition? Because retailers hold the power, as Carter Bryant expressed. Uh, did they feel they wouldn't even be able to make the brand as edgy without calling it a Collector's Edition? as is the case with Barbie collector's dolls. And I say this because according to the book, You Don't Own Me, which this insider never read, that was the sheer purpose of that Barbie collector's label. Barbie collector dolls were designed to give old-time Barbie fans dolls they wouldn't normally be able to find on toy shelves. Basically, it's so they can create edgy Barbies without receiving the backlash. They don't express it that way, of course. They market it like it's for the old-time fans. But even the business experts in the book, you don't own me, know that it's just so Mattel can get away with creating more mature looking Barbies and Barbies designed after PG-13 or rated R content. They call the Playline team uh, the child director team, while they call the collector dolls team the adult director team. So in my mind, was MGA in the same mindset when planning this collector's doll line? Did they think if we make a co more collector's lines, we would be able to sell edgier dolls. This is what I was thinking at first because of what I've been reading. Okay? So, um, but I can see that they were like, okay, we got Hayden Williams. Let's make this, an, let's, in order to put his name on it, let's make this an exclusive. So, it makes sense. But uh, I still have a hard time believing soccer moms and feminists have absolutely no impact on dolls like the Bratz doll. You know, all business experts believe that moms run retail and that influences business. Even according to the book, You Don't Own Me, they express that companies like Mattel play it safe to avoid backlash with regular Playline dolls directed to children. Where would any backlash come from? The only backlash that's ever come at Barbie has been from moms and feminists who dislike the sexualization of dolls. They separate the detailed, quality, and edgier dolls for their collector lines from the dolls on shelves just for this purpose. In the book, You Don't Own Me, that, that's how they expressed it. So this motivation would sound reasonable even for a company like MGA. And yet the insider says that the only reason they place a collector's label is because um, Hayden is involved. So in my theory, you know, I assume the collector's label was placed because MGA wanted more freedom with the brand, especially considering uh, that Brian mentioned the retailers run the industry. But if that's not the case, why play around with the collectible label at all? You know, why was it even considered? Why would they assume it would make far more money than regular play lines? Uh, I also find it interesting, MGA and this insider uh, feel the company isn't cut out for collector's lines. I, I saw that line where the, where the insider said, um, MGA isn't cut out for collector's lines. I mean, I'm sure they don't have the team they once had, but they do have a format. Okay, in 2003, MGA released the big Bratz Collector's Edition dolls. You know, uh, the Bratz 2018 dolls aren't the first collector's dolls MGA has had. Just bouncing off of that, they could have used the same formula with their newer dolls. I'm not sure I agree that MGA isn't cut out for collector's dolls. Or not sure if that varies from person to person, I don't know. But uh, with the right team, I think they can pull it off. They just need, as I've said time and time again... Someone who understands the brand and its fans. They need someone who has an eye for the details. And uh, that just goes beyond just the designer, but the whole team, you know, so...
third thing the insider said was, I think we can put the Fashion Pixies debacle to rest, honestly. That's not only very old news that does not reflect today's market, but what was also not the norm even then, which is why that line specifically gets so much attention for it. Retailers typically don't pay much attention to the finer details like individual outfits. They want the general theme and the play pattern. MGA was also in a very weird position during the time those dolls were in development. Isaac had taken on a lot of marketing people from Mattel who were in his ear and were responsible for the huge changes in direction we saw with the brand. The cookie cutter invasion, the endless for you lines, clothesmen, etc. And I believe they are who led him to start putting so much stock in retailer suggestions. For an example of this, pretty much every clothesman collection originally had the core four. The Sasha, Jade, or both were often cut only because retailers didn't see a need for them. Previously, they would have gone ahead with them anyways. If, to me, if it was just old news, why did Bryant see the need to bring it up in a conversation regarding 2015 brats? If it was just old news and doesn't apply to even the current market, why did Carter say even now he would be powerless to give this brand a push because retailers run the industry? And if it wasn't the norm for retailers to dictate every detail back in the day, why did Bryant express this at this point, as if this wasn't only a fashion pixies issue? In order to say consumers can ask for a product, but ultimately it's the retail buyers that dictate what goes on shelves, he must really believe that they run things. Okay, to go so far as to say even he, even at the helm of things, which means at the head of things, would be powerless to give the brand a new kick. Fashion pixies must have merely been an example. Bryant made it seem like retailers control what goes on shelves in totality and how that controls the outcome of the dogs. So, uh, um, on the insider's perspective, uh, that's not the case. It, it was just Mattel people in Isaac Larian's ears list to make him listen to re retailers, which still gives them power and control. But in Carter Bryant's case, they still have the power and control regardless. So, I don't know if it was just uh, marketers in Larian's ear making him listen to retailers or if they really have the control and can dictate what goes on their shelves. But further, the bit of, about the clothesmen aspect stands out to me, because the clothesmen have been an issue since 2004. We first saw this with the limited edition collectible dolls in 2003 at Wildlife Safari. Heck, look at all of 2005. I think I've listed it on uh, Please Don't, my article, Please Don't. Uh, we got Birthday Bash, didn't have Jade, Campfire, didn't have Jade or Sasha. Dynamite didn't have Jade or Sasha. Fabulous Las Vegas didn't have Jade. Hollywood Style didn't have Jade or Sasha. Eye Candy didn't have Jade or Sasha. Live in Concert barely had Jade. She was uh, an exclusive at first. Midnight Dance didn't have Jade or Sasha. Ooh La La Paris didn't have Jade or Sasha. Play Sports didn't have Jade, the original Play Sports. Okay, uh, let's, let's see. Um, I'm going through. Wild Wild West didn't have Jade or Sasha. Pretty and Punk didn't have Sasha. So, as far as I'm concerned, uh, having a Mattel team in Larian's ear uh, wouldn't have really created that clothing disaster by the time of the Brad's Fashion Pixies release. I mean, that was pro that probably was a weird year, and probably retailers didn't see the use but of Jade and Sasha, but if anything, the lines that came before that point built up the clothing factor long before it took over. Okay, so if you don't have Jay and Sasha in a number of popular lines, eventually people get used to supplementing them with the other dolls. You know, especially if the other dolls sell way higher than Sasha and Jay. So, I mean, maybe the Mattel people were seeing how they didn't really need Jay and Sasha. I don't know. This is just a theory. Unless retailers were responsible for why Jay and Sasha were admitted from the lines in 2004 too. So, what's up with that? Were they responsible for that too? Who was in his ear then when Sasha and Jade weren't in those lines? And it wasn't like they rotated Chloe and Yasmin and Sasha and Jade. Chloe and Yasmin were most all of the lines. Okay, so who influenced that? So um, that that's one question I still have. 
However, it's not surprising that more and more Mattel marketers decided to connect with MGA and influence the direction. Because I, I heard even Paula came from, was it Paula that came from Mattel? So, uh, two, uh, at first, when the brass first came out, uh, two people had come from Mattel. Based on the book, You Don't Own Me, I remember. So I'm not surprised that other people jumped ship and were like, hey, brass is the new thing. We, we, want, we want to go over there. So um, the final point that made me have more questions than answers was this. Uh, when the insider said, for an example of this, uh, pretty much every clothing collection originally had the core four, but Sasha, Jade, or both were often cut only because retailers didn't see a need for them. And this is what confused me. I, I probably need more clarity. From the beginning, the insider was saying retailers don't often make drastic changes to the brass. But omitting Sasha and Jade from lines is a drastic change. Retailers must have some power if they can tell MGA to cut two core characters out of the equation or even make that suggestion. And uh, Isaac Larian must have been given them that power to do it. To me, as an African-American woman, omitting two dolls of color because they aren't needed is a dire thing. This actually supports the fact that retailers control the biz. What else would retailers ask to be curbed because they feel it's not necessary? That That's what I'm thinking. Okay, so first they asked to change pixies. Now they said Jade and Sasha weren't needed. What else? What other comments have they been making that influenced the brat? See, I'm not there. So it makes me nervous because I don't know what's going on. I'm only hearing from these two people. Okay? So uh, in order to be in their ear to tell them Jade and Sasha is not needed, come on. So after I received this response, um, I presented all of these concerns to them. I accept the concern of um, the insider saying that Sasha and Jade were omitted by retailers because I didn't catch that until later. But um, I still had that question in my mind. But after this, I received a response um, and uh, they did respond back. OK, so I'll get into that. So this was the first response I received. Um, the insider said they greatly overestimate the impact of said soccer moms and what you think are feminists. And they said the rise of actual feminism is exactly why the general public is finally in support of a brand like Bratz and why it would succeed today though. For a long time, the general belief in the toy industry was that children had the buying power and what they called the nagging factor or something along those lines. That ultimately, Parents will buy what their children ask for, even if the parents don't necessarily approve of the product, as long as the child is insistent enough. This is partially why brats were able to succeed despite all the public scrutiny they faced at their peak. For whatever reason, within the past three or four years, this is no longer what they believe. The emphasis now is placed on targeting the millennial mom before anybody else. That's why Bratz 2015 launched with their mom-targeted brand spot and also why simply going to Barbie.com no longer takes you to Barbie's website, but instead one for parents. Again, I say all of this having been on the marketing team, attending research presentations on exactly this topic, etc. The ordered list of target audiences for Bratz 2015 was literally one, moms, two, children, three, alumni, with what they call us Bratz fans. You might think that because this is their mindset, it must be correct because that's what they're doing. But the usually failing fashion doll category tells another story. It is my understanding that they think parents care more, a, a lot more about toys than they actually do. I don't think most moms would go out of their way to purchase toys that their children have not shown any interest in just because <laughs> it appeals to them. The nagging factor, excuse, excuse the background noise, y'all. Somebody else is in the room. But um, the nagging factor is something that would never go away, though, so they should really just put the focus back on the children. Um, I agree that uh, with the insider that companies greatly overestimate the power of soccer moms and feminists. This insider is definitely right about that in my opinion. Uh, obviously I've talked about this over and over again, okay? But that overestimation itself still shows that feminists and soccer moms have a role in creating that overestimation. 
or someone has a role in creating that overestimation. You can't overestimate something if it isn't brought to you in a way that causes you to overestimate it. Obviously, the ideas that fit with some of these feminists and the mom's agenda are influencing our culture and somehow influencing the toy industry. So the soccer moms have something to do with why companies no longer believe in the nagging factor, okay? When talking about feminists, we know, come on, that there are two types. Those who advocate for women to have the right to wear whatever they want and those that believe dolls shouldn't encourage girls to objectify themselves. And then there are just a lot of feminists who believe that the brats represent girls at an age where they shouldn't even, they sh they're not old enough to make that decision. So this debate is part of the feminist sex wars. There aren't just feminists who believe women should be free to wear whatever they want. With the rise of feminism, both parties are largely vocal. Okay? And even though more people are saying let's not slut shame and all of that, they still don't believe teenagers or people under the age of 18 should dress a certain way. They still, there's still that in this culture. So when talking about feminists, you know, there are plenty of feminists, even the ones somewhat supportive of brats, that believe the brats are a bad influence on girls and sexualize underage girls, considering the brats are meant to be teenagers. So do you know, do I constantly have to show receipts? So look, check out the links below, because I've got all the links below of people who are even mildly supportive of brats who say, you know, uh, I don't think they should be wearing that, okay? Now, I've always agreed that generally parents will buy whatever kids want. I've always stated that ultimately a parent won't buy what a kid doesn't like, even if they don't personally like the kid's choice. I said this in my tree change video. I wouldn't buy a toy my kid doesn't like. I believe in the nagging factor. I don't believe that these that dolls created like tree change are going to sell to kids. I, I believe they're for parents, and that's partially why I believe they're not successful. I've said this over and over again. So I agree with the insider on this. Trust me, 100%. I'm 100% on the same page. It would make no sense to buy a toy for a kid just to have that toy become a part of the closet. Okay, that original thinking was definitely why fashion dolls succeeded so well in the past. And I'm a firm believer that the reason why dolls aren't successful today is because people are more concerned about parents than children. But we're not living during the 2K era anymore. Back then, the nagging factor had more power because people didn't have the same platform to voice their concern. They didn't end your career with the, the drop of a, of a tweet, okay? With social media, people are able to influence the public of so-called dangerous ideas to warn the public of these dangerous ideas. People take more of a stand when it comes to issues. People have more power to shape companies. I think I went to this website, I think it's an idea website, if you want to bring your ideas out there. And they said, now more than ever, people on social media have the power to shape companies. I can't even think of that website. When I do, I'll share it one of these days. So um, I, I just, I'm on the same page with that. I know that the nagging factor works more than these companies appealing to moms, soccer moms and feminists. But that doesn't mean soccer moms and feminists have no effect on what's coming out of the brats. That's just my whole point. Okay, so th I want to address this statement from the insider too. <clears throat> they said for uh, whatever reason, within the past three or four years, this is no longer what they believe. Okay, this is the page I'm on. I know companies no longer believe that parents will buy their kids anything as long as they insist on it. If they still believed in that, they wouldn't be making any changes to their dolls for any reason. But then let's think. Why don't they believe it anymore? If it isn't because of feminists and soccer moms' influence, what's influencing their beliefs on the matter? If you say social media, who are the main ones vocal about the doll's influence on children on social media? Is it that they no longer believe in it, or is it that that particular thinking on matters is now scorned upon by the general public, particularly the public that's observing dolls, and companies want to avoid public and social media backlash? Is that it? Why don't they no longer believe this? Okay? And what do they believe now? That's what I want to know. The key here is for whatever reason. Okay? That's the key here. This is the missing link here. What's that reason? Requests by people used to be more private in the 2K era. With social media, mom's requests are far more vocal and carry far more weight than they used to. If this isn't a reason in their shifts and belief, what is? This part, this part of it also gets my wheels turning, my mental wheels. Um, 
the insider said, that's why Brass 2015 launched with their mom targeted brand spot. And also why simply going to Barbie.com no longer takes you to Barbie's website, but instead work for parents. Again, I say all of this having been on the marketing team, attended research presentations on exactly this topic, etc. The ordered list of target audiences for Brass 2015 was literally one, moms, two, children, three, alumni, what they call us Bratz fans. You might think that because this is their mindset, it must be correct because that's what they're doing. But the usually failing fashion doll category tells another story. It is my understanding that they think parents care a lot more about toys than they actually do. Now, I don't understand how the beginning went from it has nothing to do with soccer moms to the emphasis now is placed on targeting the millennial mom. You can't target a group of people who have no influence on you, okay? So anyway, uh, while there are many more open-minded moms today, there are plenty of millennial moms that are also soccer moms that can't stand the brats, okay? Obviously, Brats 2015 was mom targeting. No one ever said it was the correct mindset or effective. I think most dog fans feel that the mindset is flawed. However, these ideas about what pleases moms comes from somewhere. Furthermore, there must be a reason why all of these companies are even concerned about what moms think. Maybe there's moms outside of the doll fan community that express their concern. Even if these aren't the same people that are going to go out and buy the dolls, even if it's to their liking, which I've expressed before. Okay? But they still might be very vocal about these dolls. We, I don't know. Okay? So I don't know. Why are they targeting the millennial mom? Uh, in, in my theory, I think companies are not necessarily trying to neglect the kids, but they feel the kids won't show interest in toys anymore regardless. I think psychology experts and marketers are making them think about their responsibility towards children and how their toys are influencing them. I think they have shifted focus on maintaining a clean reputation. They just want to stay stable and receive praise for being family friendly. They hope to appeal to fans and kids in the process, but they seem to want mom approval just to keep, keep themselves stable. Hoping they appeal to fans and kids in the process, even if they're failing to do that. So if the target for 2015 Bratz was moms, why is it hard to believe moms have influence on dolls like the Bratz today? As what was stated earlier in the conversation. Um, if, if the target, the insider stated, it is my understanding that they think parents care a lot more about toys than they actually do. I wholeheartedly agree with this statement. And I also believe companies care more about what parents want than what children want. I mentioned this in my two change review, as I said. Still going back to the beginning, this supports the fact that feminists and soccer moms have had an influence on the brats, whether internally through a marketing team or externally through retail and social media. There's no denying that these people have influenced companies to believe parents care more about toys than they do. There's no denying there's an overall culture shift. So I wonder if it isn't soccer moms influencing companies to believe parents care more about toys than they actually do. What is this insider, who does this insider feel is influencing these companies? Who do they feel is influencing them? That's what I want to know. That's what I want to know. Later in the discussion, uh, I addressed Carter's retailers control the industry comments and asked the insider's opinion on this. The insider stated this, Carter as a designer would be powerless because it's never even something the designers are even in the room for. The designers and creative side are actually usually the last to know much of anything once their job is done. Any discussions or discussion with retailers is between them and Isaac, the retailers and Isaac. I've literally been in line review and seen these things go down. So apparently designers are never in the room when things go down. But then I question how Carter Bryant would know that retailers control anything if he isn't even in the room with them. Furthermore, Bryant never said he would be powerless to control what retailers want, but he said he would be powerless to give this brand a new kick because retailers control the industry. It sounds like he feels his ideas would be shut down in this day and age. He even mentioned that it's a new generation and that Bratz had its day. And uh, Carter has, I, I'm just wondering how um, 
he would know retailers control the business if he's never there. So the insider continued with this. The insider said, and Carter has decades of experience in the industry and came from Mattel, where things might be different. He was also a little bit above the average designer for Bratz as more of a creative director consultant. But either way, I never said he wouldn't be aware of it, just that he would have no say in it. Obviously, the designers are made aware of changes. These are products that are literally sold in stores after all. They just find out after the decisions have been made. And once again, it probably was dire in the case of the Pixies, which is why that is the famous case and there is literally no other example anybody can name of this happening. Here, the insider does admit that Carter was a bit above the average designer. So does that mean he might be valid in saying retailers control the business or not? Because he said retailers control the business. If he was a little above the average designer, is he valid in what he's saying? Or is the insider saying he would never be in the room? So he wouldn't know whether retailers control the business. He just knows after the fact. So in his perception, maybe it seems like they control the business. Or is he saying as a creative director and consultant, he would be in the room? Or would know? I, I was a little confused with that one. That needs clarity. I need to find clarity with that one. I wish that I had caught that so that I could get that clarity. Um, but I find it interesting that the insider says there's literally no other dire examples of retailers drastically altering or changing the breasts besides fashion pixies. Because the insider mentioned in an earlier comment that retailers didn't think Jade and Sasha were needed. So they were cut. So that's another dire case as far as I'm concerned. So now the public knows there were two incidents. What this says to me is that just because there are no famous incidents doesn't mean it didn't frequently happen behind the scenes. Possibly even before this insider went to work for MGA. I mean, I don't know how long this insider has worked with MGA or how many review rooms they've been in or how many uh, market buyer so they come in contact with. I'm only going by statements, but who's to say there were no other cases? How many meetings has this insider been in to make that assessment? I would like to know how many, how many, how many of these, uh, review rooms have you been in? Okay. And, uh, for, it also tells me that apparently different people have different ideas of what's a dire change or alteration. Uh, some people think changing outfits is a dire thing. I think omitting dolls of color is a dire thing, okay? Isaac Larian may have been rather good at getting as much as he could to retailers, but if retailers can even decide which core Bratz girls make it on shelves and which don't, doesn't that mean they kind of do control what goes on? Okay, maybe it was just a suggestion, and as the person said, Mattel marketers were in their ears. But then, why would Larian think it's smart to listen to them? I mean, let's look at 2007 to 2009. There were too many lines where Jade and Sasha were omitted. That's not a light change as far as I'm concerned. Okay. And then even going back to 2004, Jade and Sasha weren't in majority of those lines. 2005, rather. You know, they were not in most of those lines. So that's a drastic thing to me as far as I'm concerned. So now we, Fashion Pixies is not the only situation. Now we're hearing that Dolls of Color were omitted too. So I'm trying to understand the power that retail has here. Um, do they have power? Can they say that can't go on the shelves? We don't have a need for that. And that's what happens. Or is it a matter of Larian takes back their critiques and decides what he doesn't want or wants? And then he, it still makes it to retail shelves without their critiques. I don't know how that's supposed to operate. Okay. I find it interesting that not only did Carter say, I would be powerless to give this brand much of a new kick, but he also said it's because retailers control the business. I keep emphasizing that. Again, how would he know this? How would he know that consumers can ask for what they want from manufacturers, but ultimately it's retailers who decide every last detail. If this didn't happen in more than one case. 
No one forms drastic conclusions like that from one incident. What has Carter seen that has made him say, okay, no matter what we do, you know, they're going to keep shutting it down. They must have, been, if, if Carter's not in the room as a designer, then Larry must have been coming back to him often to tell him, okay, this needs to be changed, that needs to be changed. They must be coming back often, okay, for him to say, man, they control this whole industry. And I'm saying this must have been happening to him at all these different toy companies he's worked for. I'm just saying, okay? So I wonder, do retailers have the power or do they not? The insider made it seem like it's not a big deal, but Carter Bryan made it seem like it shapes what happens with the doll break. I, I mean, I guess it depends on your role in the company and how you have perceived things. I, I guess that's... I guess neither is right or wrong. I'm not sure. So the insider later mentioned, if I were in Carter's position with the experience he had on Bratz where retailers did have a lot more control at one point, and I had been brought in at the beginning of development, then heard and seen nothing until things hit shelves, and they are the way they were, I would immediately think the retailers were at fault too. So basically, the insider is saying Carter was expressing from his point of view because he never saw what was happening, really. Basically, it sounds like the insider is saying Bryant doesn't really know what he's talking about, in other words. Maybe he's uh, been away from the doll industry too long to know what's going on, though Carter did share with me some newer toys he's worked on, so he probably hasn't been that far removed from the toy industry, but maybe he, uh, from his perspective, because he hadn't heard or seen anything until it hit shelves. He just thought retailers controlled everything. Or maybe they just have two different views on what's wrong with the industry. <laughs> I don't know. It'd be interesting to see a conversation between Bryant and the insider to really get clarity, but that's probably not gonna happen. <laughs>
obviously there must be some connection between what moms, feminists want and the current toy industry culture. Um, in the article, Toy Fair 2018, Are You Ready to Join the Doll Fight Club? The writer, Stephanie Finnegan, stated, Toy Fair 2018 was rife with dolls that reflect to try to mirror what today's girls are all about. The clothing was more streamlined and reflective of the real world. Not that many flouncy dresses and acres of petticoats. The uh, girl dolls were dressed to tackle outdoor sports with Title IX helping them to attain those soccer or football goals that once only belonged to their male schoolmates. At Toy Fair, so many of the dolls were garbed as athletes or at least athletic young women. Their creators also supply home turf for them. So it's not just a dream house that the dolls can retreat to. It's also a camper, a stable, a locker room, sauna, and a wide variety of outdoor possibilities. The dolls of 2018 have places to go and mountains to literally climb. That's a major takeaway from Toy Fair. While girls have been encouraged since the mid-1970s to participate more in sports, shown that a career in athletics can be theirs, not just their brothers, they have not been enticed to play with dolls. If anything, a doll has often been associated with toxic femininity. You know that has to exist in some people's minds. It's the antonym yet similar rallying cry of toxic masculinity. While young girls have been tempted and propelled into becoming more jockish and more competitive, dolls have been pretty much ignored, except for at Halloween where they pop up as evildoers and villains. At this year's Toy Fair, I think the game plan, to borrow a sports term, is to make dolls reflect where girls are being pushed to pursue. Just as a girl may never grow up to be a runway model, movie star, or head cheerleader, she could fantasize about it via her Cindy, her Jean, or her Barbie. The doll was wish fulfillment. The same holds true for these new dolls that seem to have all the answers for outdoor fun and games. They are able to ride horses, <coughs> catch trophy-sized fish, careen in race cars, and score series-winning points. The new dolls are able to pin an opponent in a wrestling ring, not worry about getting pinned by a fraternity sweetheart or receiving a ring from a smitten suitor. These are dolls that could do an episode of cable TV's Naked and Afraid without batting an eyelash. They never show fear, and they never have to worry about their anatomy being blurred out. One just has to look at popular music videos. Okay, this is what I'm saying. You know, you just have to look at popular videos like Pink Stupid Girls to understand where this kind of mindset is coming from and how it has been subtly influencing culture for the last two decades, okay? And now with social media, just about everybody can see that kind of uh, uh, message out there, okay? So that's all I'm saying about that. Um, the insider's next statement regarding was regarding uh, why brats turned out the way they did in 2015. So um, they said, MGA brought in a whole horde of new people and fancy million dollar, not exaggerating sadly, marketing deals. All of these people were heavily against brats and what they were. With their brand director at the time literally saying on the day she was hired, I never thought I would work on brats. I have always hated them which is how things turned into what they did. Um, this is where the insider believes that the reason 2015 Bratz was so awful was because they got people who dislike Bratz on board. And this is juicy news to me. I know a lot about Bratz. I, I knew the people working on the Bratz didn't know about the brand. I knew it. Just when I saw interviews about them, I was like, they don't know nothing about the Bratz. But to say I always hated them, like, come on. Wow. That's something I didn't know. Okay, so, um, but again, even with this new brand director they hired in 2015, um, did anyone ever ask her on the slide why she said she always hated them? Uh, looking at 2015 Bratz, it was obvious, and I hate to keep reiterating this, she was supporting the feminist soccer mom agenda. So come on, come on, you can't tell me she wasn't influenced by that agenda. She took her opportunity to direct Bratz into a feminist soccer mom brand. Come on. And you can tell me that was just her preferred aesthetic. Why? Tell me why she disliked Bratz to begin with. Why she targeted this to mom. Come on. 
So if we have someone within the brand influencing the direction of brats according to the soccer mom agenda, how can anyone deny that soccer moms had anything to do with it? One of them was working in brand. I'm not sure if she was actually a mother, but she was one of those supporters. So as far as I'm concerned, she's a soccer mom. I'm sure there are more of them lurking within the industry, trying to change up the fashion doll industry so that there are different influences for girls. I'm sure there's a lot of them working for Mattel. I'm, I know for certain there are a lot of them working for American Girl, okay? They, they're concerned about the message dolls are sending. In fact, a lot of them are getting into the toy industry because they're concerned about the message dolls are sending to girls. Look at Sonya Singh, who made Tree Chain. She's like, I, I hope these dolls do influence companies. She, she started making her own dolls because she wants to influence the toy industry. All right? And, and this brand director seemed to have the same goal. It doesn't sound like she didn't like the body aesthetic, because, especially because she enlarged the head and feet even more. I mean, she probably didn't like the sassy eyes, but why wouldn't she? Looking at her direction, it seems she wanted to make these dolls more wholesome. And that in itself shows how much influence soccer moms and feminists have on marketing teams and directors entering the fashion doll industry. That shows even how they're influencing the culture. They aren't just on social media ranting anymore. They are working through the industry, getting jobs in these areas so that girls can have different role models to play with. And we don't just see this with brats. Look at Barbie. It's difficult for me to understand how anyone can deny feminists and moms influence on her, influences on her. With the large number of body positive dolls, individualized dolls of color, and covered up Barbie dolls, it's clear who is in control. Look at how Disney Princess is changing with Hasbro. Moana is considered body positive in comparison to her skinny princess peers. Disney's newest dolls are far more covered up than they once were. They look sweeter too. Trust me, I'm, I'm not saying it's all bad. Cause I, I'm glad that uh, Barbie has body positive dolls that look so uh, versatile. When I first saw it, I was like, wow, it looks more diverse and I like that. Uh, trust me, I don't think that's all bad. But whether it's bad or good, the influence is still there. And it can work for bad or good. Okay, it's not about whether it's good or not in anyone's perception, but it can work in a doll's favor and work against a doll's favor. In Brat's case, it's worked against them because it's not the core of their brand. Okay? You know, to say soccer moms have nothing to do with the 2015 direction of Brat's is to say moms don't run retail. And everything in the business disagrees. You know, so I felt like from the beginning saying that it had nothing to do with soccer moms or whatever else. To cut to this point, while we're saying the director literally wanted to target this to moms, I find them to be related. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. So um, finally, I asked the insider why MGA hired a team that didn't care for the brand and why they allowed it to change. Um, I want to share this point that was made by this insider because I think it makes total sense. Um, the insider said it wasn't NGA's, Isaac's conscious decision to switch gears. And if you ask Isaac at any point then what their mission was, he would still say it was to bring back the brand's core DNA, as they called it. Things just unraveled into the exact opposite of that as the new people took control. They didn't uh, hire them because they were anti-brats or even knowing that that was the case. They just hired literally anybody who was willing to take the job. The brand at uh, that point was not seen as a desirable one to work on. They took whoever they could get. It was not ever retailers who introduced the idea of targeting moms or going super kitty. It was the hugely expensive marketing firm they hired. They later ended up ending their contract much earlier once they realized they weren't fit to do any doll line. And the Bratz hating brand director who took them in that direction because they thought it would work better and because she favored that aesthetic personally. She literally cut their side glances only because she doesn't like dolls to look to the side. To give an example of her thought process for brats. Um, of everything, this is the one thing I learned. So from the insider's perspective, retailers didn't have anything to do with the brats 2015 change. Of course, Carter Bryant was sure that retailers have an overall effect on the direction companies take. But it looks like there was an issue long before brats 2015 got on shelves. Um, I questioned what MGA saw in this new marketing team. How did this market director sell herself? Like, I'm sure there was a screening process before these people were hired. 
I mean, I know neither person, the insider or Bryant personally, neither person is working for MGA at the moment either. As far as I'm concerned, they're both just talking to other inside connections themselves or elaborating on their own personal experiences with the brand when they were with MGA. Still, they both have far more experience than I do with the brand. I have experience with uh, business and the toy industry as a whole, for sure. Uh, I've been a fan of the toy industry since the 1990s, but I can't tell any of them about the Bratz brand. So as far as I'm concerned, this sounds legit. Like, they must have hired, and, and this is what I suspected before Carter Bryant got in the mix. I should say Carter Bryant shifted my thoughts. Because when I first wrote my Bratz 2015 article, I was like, they got people in there who don't know what they're doing. But uh, Carter Bryant's comments shifted my opinion a little bit when he was saying that retailers control the biz. So even if, you know, this woman wasn't responsible for uh, making Brad Sweeter in 2015, Brad still wouldn't have come in strong. That's what I got from Carter Bryant's comments, okay? But I think the insider's view makes sense here, though. Obviously, it was the new marketing team that went for the kitty thing. And it makes sense that NGA hired them because they had no one else. Okay, again, like I said in my last video, a lot of people, had, they had severed a lot of their ties. MGA had severed a lot of their ties. Okay, a lot of their connections. So I'm sure there were not a lot of people who wanted to risk working for MGA. In fact, I used to see um, <laughs> on a, a job search, um, job search website that they were hiring marketing teams. Uh, I would see it because uh, I would think about applying to <laughs> Uh, but, uh, this comment makes me further stand my, but, but th this comment overall, I totally think was the most educational for me. Uh, however, it does make me further stand by, by, by my belief that soccer moms have gotten control of the toy industry. Um, the brand director herself was obviously on that same soccer mom bandwagon when she decided to market Bratz 2015 to moms. She was one of these people controlling the outcome of Bratz. So again, moms continue to control the industry, even by latching onto vulnerable companies to do so, even in the form of marketers. Like, what's American Girl's excuse? What's Barbie's excuse? What's the deal with Betty Spaghetti? Okay, why are all these dolls foregoing their former images? You know, as I said in response, has this director ever slipped and specified why they dislike brass to begin with? If they honestly dislike brass because they just didn't like the design aesthetic of brass, you know, the big bubble heads, skinny bodies, and big feet, that's one thing. Though it could be possible because they highlighted those qualities. But if they didn't like the original brats because they felt brats were bad influence on the world, that doesn't negate the fact that feminists and soccer moms control the industry. And that, in fact, supports that theory. A marketing team like this points to the fact that feminists and soccer moms have influence over the brats and other dolls. These types of marketing teams are able to prey on vulnerable companies like MGA and shape the industry to meet these minor vocal groups. It seems the marketing team hated the brats because of what they stood for. Am I wrong? If the company has directors, marketers, and designers who support the soccer mom is, you know, splinter news type of feminists, even working with doll lines like brats nowadays, doesn't that show that they have some influence over how these dolls turn out. That's all I'm saying. So last, um, the insider stated, Isaac himself actually wasn't even aware of many things going on behind the scenes on Bratz during that time, during the Bratz 2015 era. Um, many things they literally lied to him about or did behind his back. I think people tend to have too much faith in MGA as a company to make smart decisions and plan effectively, or even just to do what makes sense. Everything that comes out of them is an accident or a coincidence. And even at the brand's peak, that was the case. Nobody was on the same page in 2015. Of course, it doesn't make sense, and that's why it failed miserably after that summer. If there was an actual solid reason for any of it, it would have worked, and they'd still be going to this day with that direction. The way things panned out for Monster High and Barbie's ever-declining sales paint a similar picture. Um, I personally feel that there was nothing that passed Larian's eyes. Uh, 
most CEOs know what's coming out of their companies before it does. You know, in observing businesses, I've yet to hear of any company CEOs just letting things hit shelves without their approval, scan, and input. Um, I doubt people just like the 2015 dolls to shelves. You know, hmm, I don't know. Yeah, I don't really believe it. Though Larry N may have said this was the case, I don't think it was. I think Larry N approved. <laughs> I think he thought. And then, I, I'm just saying what's a theory. This person's actually in contact with these people. So maybe I just need to just sit down and have several seats. But <laughs> I, I just have a hard time believing that a CEO doesn't know what's coming out of their own company. Uh, but I've heard that most, the, most of the things created in MGA, even at its height, was a result of coincidences and accidents. And accidents. Um, I heard this from the book, You Don't Own Me. Uh, really, most business successes are the result of coincidence. <laughs> the book Good to Great by Jim Collins really highlights that about business. That's another good read for anyone interested. Uh, you know, most most things are hits hits and misses, honestly. So um, now the insider says there wasn't any solid reason for any of it. But I wonder if that's the case. I wonder if there really was a reason that's not being disclosed. What was Larian's true reason for allowing the brand's image to change so drastically over the last couple of years? What was his motivation? Why did he allow Bratz to change in 2015? Why did he think that would please fans? Why, why, why did he think that? Why did he allow the, why did he allow those dolls to go through? Um, I agree that people expect MJ to make excellent decisions, as we we expect that of all companies we want to support. We expect businesses to make good decisions, but I also think that people are quick to blame MGA when things go wrong and not understand why things are spiraling out of control to begin with on a business level. I think people put too much faith in MGA's ability to bring the old brats look back. I, I actually think people put too much faith in MJ to be able to do that. Is there a possibility that they can't? Because every time that's brought to the table, every time I bring it to the table, it seems some people want to believe MGA just missed the mark with good intentions. And every time I bring that to the table, people are looking at me like I have two heads. They're telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. Every time I'm like, well, maybe they possibly can. Oh, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Maybe I don't. I, but I think people are too quick to say, oh, it's just MGA's fault. It's just the people they're hiring. It could be more to the story that I don't know. Because it seems like everybody who worked in the industry has a different perception as far as I'm concerned. You know, I believe in looking at all possibilities. When people start telling me to shut up, that's when I peer even closer. That's when I try to look even closer, y'all. I'm sorry if this was long and winded, but I wanted to get this out. Okay? So to end this discussion, I just want to ask, what is the truth behind the sudden change in the 2015 dolls and their current transition into the 2018 dolls? Is it, as Carter stated, an issue with retail? Or is it, as the insider stated, company paranoias, disorganization, horrible directors, and desperation that caused the downfall of the brats? <laughs> Who runs the toy industry today? Toy marketers, market buyers, or soccer moms and feminists? We have the one worker, Bryant, who has worked for both Mattel in the 1990s, Bratz in the 2K era, and the Bridge Direct company around 2013-2014. This We have him saying retailers control the business. This is a man with 20 plus years of experience, but he's no longer working in the toy industry and he isn't working for Bratz anymore. Well, he claimed, he said that he's he's got another toy product that he's working on, so... I'm just patiently waiting for it, but he isn't working for Bratz anymore. So does that mean his outlook is outdated? Um, now, then we have the insider who has been a longtime fan of Bratz, uh, worked for Bratz with the marketing team for a couple of years, but no longer works for MGA. Um, this insider has made many friends within the company and apparently still has worked in some capacity with the current dolls, uh, but they don't seem to be a full-time employee. So the insider has seen how the modern day industry 
is shaping brats and possibly even shaping all dogs. As an inquisitive blogger, y'all, I aim to find out the truth. I will probably be investigating more about this topic as the year progresses um, and hopefully gain some more insight. Uh, my dream is to talk to Isaac Larian himself. <laughs> I'm determined to dig deeper into this. So um, a video of this will be of, of my uh, review of the 2018 Bratz Dolls is going to be next. I'm going to tell you guys what I think about the photos of these Bratz Dolls. Um, I'm actually going to do an article and a video, so stay tuned for that. Leave me a comment and let you let me know what you think about this discussion. Why do you think the brats and all dolls in the industry have been changing their image lately? You're welcome to share. And if you have any comments or concerns or corrections, leave me a comment and I will address it. Peace. Ciao. Let's talk about fashion. Let it on my passion. Chris about your action. It's about your action. Well, action.